shape our memories. And for most of the 20th century, those events were filmed and explained by Pathé. Pathé News captured history in motion, creating a living chronicle of a turbulent century. 1962 was the year in which the world came close to nuclear war. Events during 1961 had worsened relations between Russia and America. The Berlin Wall and the outcry that followed its erection had hardened the convictions of East and West. A disastrous collision between the two superpowers seemed to be inevitable. In Russia, the Soviet president, Nikita Khrushchev, was living up to his reputation as a hard-headed leader. Despite summit meetings with President Kennedy, the world situation seemed hostile and dangerous. The flashpoint came with the Cuban Missile Crisis. During the summer of 1962, American intelligence sources reported that Cuba and Russia were fast becoming allies. Since its 1959 revolution, Cuba had been led by Fidel Castro. At first, relations between the United States and Cuba had been close. But when Castro began to create a socialist state, America became hostile. An abortive invasion sponsored by the U.S. and led by Cuban exiles failed at the Bay of Pigs in April of 1961, and Castro sought protection from the Soviets. American reconnaissance flights detected missile silos and installations on the island. Soon, evidence of ballistic nuclear missiles surfaced, and the American nation was shocked to learn that just 90 miles from the coast of Florida sat nuclear weapons which could hit any major U.S. city. Kennedy demanded their withdrawal. Khrushchev countered by calling for the removal of NATO nuclear weapons from Turkey. Khrushchev seemed to take pleasure in America's unease. Russia thought it fair that if she had to suffer the presence of nuclear weapons a few miles from Soviet soil, why shouldn't the Americans be in the same position? Kennedy couldn't see the similarity. He decided to take a tough line. He started a naval blockade of Cuba so as to prevent new weapons arriving and to force Cuba and Russia to give in. Stalemate turned to fear. The peoples of the world watched as the prospect of nuclear war neared. From the 26th of October to the 28th, the world held its breath. To the world's relief, Khrushchev finally gave in. Kennedy's firmness attracted much praise from around the world but his stature as a world statesman was greatly enhanced. All missiles were dismantled and removed from Cuba, and moves were made to improve East-West relations. The Brandenburg Gate stands like a bastion between the free world and communist thraldom behind the Iron Curtain. It was inspected by the Foreign Secretary during his visit to Berlin. All in the British sector favorably impressed Lord Hume. He was escorted by the mayor, Willy Brandt, who personifies the inflexible will of West Germans to retain their rights to their part of the old capital. That, with Allied support, has so far deterred Russia from trying to push us out of the city, as Khrushchev threatened earlier. Across the wall, East Germans look into the Western zones, envying perhaps the free way of life denied to them. Lord Hume afterwards said that the wall stands there as a confession of the failure of red rule which can only keep people in the eastern sector by force. It puts the clock back to the Middle Ages. Mayor Brandt took the Foreign Secretary to the West Berlin Town Hall. There, Lord Hume signed the Golden Book, adding his name to those who, in their city, have assured the West Germans of Allied support. A small freedom bell was given him, a memento of a welcome visit. 
1,600 happy people were on board the latest Atlantic liner, the France. Among them on the shakedown cruise was Madame de Gaulle and ministers of the government. Destination, the Canary Islands. From state cabins to engine room, the France is the last word in luxury travel, making a strong bid for the cream of the transatlantic business. Later, with lights blazing, the scene on board resembled a state occasion, a foretaste of what awaits first-class passengers on all the liner's ocean crossings. There are times that are bound to be the queasy few who can't stir from their cabins. In fancy dress as Toulouse-Lautrec. This was no take-it-or-leave-it trip from Clyde to Wigan Pier, but a cruise in style with all the French know-how. Hangovers could be got rid of next day. Harder, man, harder. Give us some more knots. They were soon in the sun, forgetting about winter back home. The special funnels keep smoke clear of the decks. Before long, land was sighted, Tenerife, where the ship dropped anchor. A wonderful trip. Once more, Colonel John Glenn was all set to journey into space. He showed no signs of tension, despite previous frustrations and delays. This time, all America hoped the flight really would be on. What tremendous preparation and cost had gone into the whole Man in Space program. After this attempt, the bill for the taxpayer would amount to nearly 143 million pounds. The imperturbable astronaut lowered himself into the Mercury capsule, Friendship 7, in which he would have to wait for the long countdown. He had been this far before, only to have the attempt postponed. Now everybody understood why astronauts have to be so carefully selected and trained. This time, conditions were perfect, the launching itself without fault. All went well with the giant Atlas rocket, and at 17,545 miles an hour, Colonel Glenn went into orbit. As he was completing the third orbit, he began his descent, opening the parachute and then inflating the huge air cushion to break the impact on the water. About 200 miles north of Puerto Rico, the capsule was sighted and the destroyer Noah came alongside to hoist it aboard. What a thrilling moment for the crew, that there should be the ship to retrieve the capsule and the heroic John Glenn after the space flight of four hours, 56 minutes. To get out, Glenn blew open the side hatch and his ordeal was over. He told the crew of the destroyer he felt fine. Afterwards, President Kennedy telephoned to say, we are proud of you, you did a wonderful job. The Queen added her congratulations. As the first American to orbit the Earth, brave John Glenn is sure of a lasting place in his country's history. Almost bursting at the seams, the colony of Hong Kong is invaded by new floods of would-be refugees from the mainland of China. As there's only shantytown accommodation for many of the million refugees already in Hong Kong, there's no room for the 4,000 a day who have tried to come in lately. Helicopters fly at first light, looking for Chinese who have entered the colony by night. Police round them up, for they've got to be sent back. So limited are the resources of Hong Kong that if the refugees were allowed to stay, famine and cholera might result. Yet as lorries take them back to the frontier, the Chinese have the sympathy of the people. Food, cigarettes and medicines are showered on them. Fear of approaching famine is thought to be the reason why so many have fled from their native South China, which normally no more than 50 a day are allowed to leave. Now the communist farming system has all but broken down, and hundreds of thousands are hungry victims of the Red Series. A 
task force of the American 7th Fleet rushed towards Bangkok, capital of Thailand. Timely action to deal with the potentially explosive situation in Laos, Thailand's troubled neighbor. Laotian communists are said to have broken the ceasefire agreement. These local flare-ups could develop into another Korea if they go unchecked. To avert such a catastrophe, Defense Secretary McNamara visited the danger area. Our own government will send help if Thailand asks for it. Meanwhile at home, the American services held open house at Army, Air Force and Navy depots throughout the country. Used in training paratroops, the Jump Tower was top attraction at Andrews Air Force Base. Naval depots turned themselves into fun fairs with equal success. Overhead, the Blue Angels put on a show. Ground level ejection. The performance that really stole the show came from the Rocket Man, all set to make leaps of 120 yards. In the rush hour, how to beat the two. War ravaged Algiers was jubilant to the point of hysteria. By a 201 majority, the referendum had declared for independence and 132 years of French rule was over. The rejoicing went on through the night. Even Oran, last big stronghold of the OAS, seemed to think the war was all over. Then some shooting broke out. Just why and when isn't yet clear. Some estimated the killed at 100. Even in Algiers, the jubilation may have been premature. Ben Kedda, provisional governor premier, was hero of the hour, but his rival, Ben Bella, says he commands the allegiance of 10,000 troops. Not even yet is it peace in Algeria. Mont Blanc, Europe's highest mountain, is being tunneled. From Chamonix, the French began boring three years ago, and the workers, so far from being forgotten, were now being taken into the mountain to meet the Italians who have been digging from the other side. What a breathtaking view the great mountain is from an airliner. Flying or going round by road won't be the only ways much longer. The tunnelers, for seven and a half miles, encountered water and falling rock, but they triumphed. To the father of the French finance minister, Edmond d'Estaigne, went the honor of exploding the last charge. So the Italians met the French. To the layman, it's always a miracle how tunnelers from opposite sides don't miss each other, one of the mysteries of engineering. D'Estaigne embraced his Italian counterpart, always a feature of big occasions, and indeed, this was one of which both countries could be proud. The tunnel is for road traffic, not rail. It'll cut 125 miles off the road to Rome. Next, what about the Channel Tunnel? When will the Berlin problem be solved? Another youth has been shot dead trying to escape from the eastern sector. A few days earlier, on this spot, 18-year-old Peter Fechter suffered the same fate and was left to bleed to death on the wire. Bricked up windows and machine gun posts make it all but impossible to get over the wall of shame and reach freedom. Here, Germans are divided against themselves. Peter Fechter Street, they call it, a reproach to the inhuman savagery of rule behind the Iron Curtain. Angry Berliners stoned the bus bringing Russians to guard the Soviet war memorial, which is incongruously in the Western Zone. Now the Red soldiers come in armored cars. West Berlin police have their work cut out, trying to prevent matters getting out of hand, while Russia makes new diplomatic moves, hoping to force the Allies out of Berlin altogether. What a situation. For 
Port-au-Prince, thriving capital and chief port of the Republic of Haiti, has the look of the 1960s, allowing for Caribbean local color, and many of its 250,000 people are Christians, for the faith was implanted by the French when they ruled the country. But inland, the beliefs brought by the Negroes from Africa centuries ago are very much alive. Pathé News foreign correspondents recently secured quite remarkable films of voodoo observances, showing that the ancient superstitions are proof against the march of civilization. Parties of spirit worshippers sail to a secret meeting place. It's not uncommon for some to go into a trance, as if hypnotized by the drug. From these Caribbean shores, it's a far cry to the darkest Africa of centuries ago. But the jungle faiths span the time and the thousands of miles. Washed by the waterfall during the three days of the ceremony are at least 15,000 people, according to reliable reports. And here the voodoo followers make their sacrifices and obeisances to Dambala, the spirit of knowledge. But for these pictures, few would know what a powerful hold voodoo has on the four million people of Haiti. In the new Africa, one more independent country, the state of Uganda. The present Kabaka is His Highness Sir Edward William Frederick David Walungembe Mutebi Luangula Mutesa II who now welcomes the Duke and Duchess. And now the Kabaka presents his ministers to the Duke and Duchess. Even at a cocktail party, a certain amount of formality is inevitable, but the crowds in the streets have no such inhibitions. They've got a new independence to celebrate, and they celebrate it, pausing to greet their visitors as they go by. The British, too, can contribute their share of noise and color to a celebration when they want to, and the Scots Guards do just that for the big independence tattoo in Kololo Stadium. This is the climax of all these days of rejoicing, because here at midnight, Uganda's independence will formally begin. Sergeant Major Sidney Small of Birmingham lowers the Union Jack that has flown in Uganda for nearly 70 years. At the same moment, the 4th Battalion King's African Rifles becomes the 1st Battalion Uganda Rifles. And to replace the Union Jack, the black, gold and red flag of the new young state, Uganda is born again, free and independent. The man who talked to the Russians plainly, firmly, and meant every word he said is the hero of America and is fervently thanked by the great majority of the Western world. Now dramatically from Havana come films taken on the eve of the crisis. A tenseness was unmistakable. Both people and government expected an American invasion. Students helped to man the anti-aircraft guns. Not very impressive looking weapons against the sort of planes the U.S. could have sent over if invasion had been the plan. At last, the Cubans, army and people, knew that Russian rocket sites had been installed and that more were on the way before President Kennedy imposed the blockade. Needless to say, it was still easy to fan anti-American feeling, playing on the supposed threat of invasion. After Kennedy called the Russian bluff, even the Cubans sensed that Castro suspected he had backed the wrong horse. The rockets will be dismantled and taken away. And to the United Nations to negotiate and do a little face-saving for the Kremlin came Vasily Kuznetsov. First Deputy Foreign Minister, he's the man usually called on when Moscow is in an awkward position. Youth that welcomed him. 
A week before, there were few smiling faces at the United Nations. Nor would there have been many now, but for the steadfast yet moderate attitude of President Kennedy. In Britain, the consumer boom that had gathered pace during the 50s continued. More people than ever could enjoy the delights of modern domestic technology. Everybody wanted to own a car, and if you could afford it, there was a vast range to choose from. Air travel was fast becoming the norm, and soon package holidays would lure Britons to Spain and the Mediterranean in huge numbers. In 1962, the prospect of supersonic flight across the Atlantic excited the cinema-going public. Pathé reported on a new project to build an airliner that would reach America in three hours, a project that would eventually give birth to Concorde. In government, the Conservative Party entered its 11th consecutive year in power, and in 1962, the administration seemed to run out of steam. Macmillan's health started to fail, the cabinet seemed ineffectual, and internal wranglings plagued the day-to-day -day running of the government. The Tory party's popularity in the country declined steadily, and a sluggish economy helped to make the situation worse. Macmillan attempted to inject new life into his team by sacking seven of them at one go, including his Chancellor of the Exchequer, but it did little to lift morale. South Coast, they had the worst gale for many a long day. How it did blow. And this was the scene only a few days before the gales. Snow, blizzard, and the lowest temperatures for years and years. What a way to begin the new year. Back to the gales, with Western Supermare enduring weather the summer visitors wouldn't have thought possible. One part and another, four people were killed, and gusts reached 100 miles an hour. There's a spot in Bournemouth where coins dropped on the sands in summer are always washed up by winter's first gale. It was worth the risk to reap the best harvest they've ever had. One boy got more than two pounds. Lounge facing sea? You can have it. Sorry, no teas today. A London crash, which might have been much worse. An 80-ton, 120-foot crane blew down. Nobody killed. There might have been. If the driver hadn't been five minutes late for work, he'd have been in the top cabin. It just shows how risky is this modern craze for punctuality. It's going to be quite a job getting this little thing back on an even keel and on its pedestal again. Meanwhile, the seas went on pounding away. For a long time to come, we're all going to remember the New Year gale. on the runway. Irritating weather delays were at last over and Britain's second generation jet airliner was ready to take the air. Newsreels and pressmen were there to record the event as she sped down the runway. A second or so later, Trident was airborne. What a moment for everybody at De Havilland. Here at Hatfield, five more Tridents are being built. BEA have ordered 24. These aircraft will seat 100 passengers and cruise at 585 miles an hour. The Trident was back, low over the airfield for all to get a good view, 80 minutes after the takeoff. Cunningham had taken her up to 15,000 feet and found her perfect to handle. They were all pleased as punch, designers, builders, and test pilot Cunningham. That universal dream, the ideal home, will be drawing at least a million people to Olympia in the next few weeks. The famous Daily Mail exhibition, showing everything from private swimming pools to corkscrews, 
has become a feature of London in the early spring. The Whirler wash is portable, sells for nine pounds, and is ideal for caravans and bachelor homes. As an alternative to having a good old gossip at the laundrette, it's got something. No home is ideal if your figures got completely out of control. The Lissom Rest takes off the unwanted inches without dieting or going to a masseuse. The Radiant Heat Fold Away Cooker makes no smoke, smell or splattering. It's portable, so can be used in any room or at a friend's house if you don't like their cooking. An idea from Norway, a log house which can be entered if you come home late, having lost your key and don't want anyone to know. The insulation afforded by timber walls, five inches thick, is better than can be obtained by 11-inch cavity brick. The A-line vacation home, so-called because the end resembles the letter A, is a packaged frame house of cedar wood. It has a living room, bedroom and kitchen, an attractive second home. Now, imagine that you had your wish, a beautiful house just where you would like it to be. Well, here it is, the house in the sun in a Caribbean setting. You could run a bath and watch TV without getting out of bed. Sir Malcolm Sargent's ideas inspired the living room. Valerie Hobson designed the kitchen. It's a glorious dream, coming out of the London cold and there you are in the Caribbean. Well, of course, it may happen. The big day began at London Airport, where the Duke of Edinburgh took Prince Charles to fly him to school. The Duke used the Heron aircraft in which he has made many flights. Prince Charles showed no sign of nerves, whatever he may have been feeling. This is the really modern way to go to school, by aeroplane, piloted by father. At Gordonston, the Prince of Wales will spend the next five years, a complete break with royal tradition. On arrival, the Duke and his son were received by the Chairman of the Governors, the kilted Captain Ian Tennant. Next, the Headmaster, Mr. Robert Chew, with whom was the Warden, Mr. Henry Breton. Thirty years ago, Prince Philip was a boy at Gordonston, the main reason why the Queen and he are sending Prince Charles here. The Headmaster pointed out Prince Philip's old room. The 17th century mansion houses the main part of the school, but Windmill Lodge will be Prince Charles's house. To Mr. Robert Whitby, the housemaster, the head boy and the head of the house, the new boy was introduced. The Duke knew he was leaving his son in capable hands. Peter Pace, the head boy, is 18. Prince Charles will wear the jersey and short uniform for the rest of his stay at Gordonston. Dougald Mackenzie, head of Windmill House, is a joiner's son. So the Prince will be living in a much more democratic atmosphere than if he'd gone to Eton or Harrow. Gordonston puts the emphasis on fitness and self-reliance no less than schoolwork. If it makes Prince Charles as good a man as his father, it will have served him and the country well. It's not a demonstration of how to be silly when driving. This was just a warm-up at Haringey Stadium before something really spectacular. French stunt driver Joel Delamere was about to drive at 55 miles an hour into a stationary car with no more protection than a standard safety belt. A driver without a belt would have shot through the screen. One famous spectator, Donald Gamble, owes his life to the belt he wore when Bluebird came to grief. But now for another crash. Again, no harm to the driver. Even so, it pays to be careful, because this sort of thing does tend to spoil the car. As there are more ways than one of having a crash, watch this. Even after all that, he's all right. Joe Delamere, with a safety belt, seems indestructible. Thinking beyond crash helmets and safety belts, 
there may be an enormous market for suits of armor. A solemn procession makes its way through the streets of Oxford, where an honorary degree of Doctor of Letters of that university is to be bestowed on Mr. Charles Chaplin, that elder statesman of immortal slapstick. Other well-known figures being honored include artist Graham Sutherland, violinist Yehudi Menuhin, and American Secretary of State, Mr. Dean Rusk. Speaking of Charlie, the public orator reminds the distinguished gathering in the town hall that he has invited our laughter in many ways, including Perbracas illas fluitantes, exiguum denique labri superioris ornamentum. And that is Latin for baggy trousers and a toothbrush moustache. A big day for British aviation. The BC-10 was to take to the air for the first time. All eyes were on the 600 mile an hour jetliner as she taxied for the first time under her own power. A dummy run has Captain Bryce, chief test pilot of British Aircraft Corporation, breaking hard against the massive power of four of the latest Rolls-Royce Conway engines. A tense moment as the giant 151 passenger airliner lifts off the runway at Weybridge, the world's most powerful long-range jetliner. The climax to six years' work. Already orders for 42 VC-10s are in hand. A fine British achievement. Upon the fantastic dish aerial at Cornwall's Ganelli Downs focused the interest of the nation. The scientists and the post office engineers were on the threshold of completing an historic experiment. At Cape Canaveral, they were not launching just one more rocket. The 90-foot Thor Delta carried Telstar, the satellite destined to bounce TV pictures from America to Britain and France. set at Grinelli. At the controls, the post office engineers directed the aerial in line with a signal from Telstar more than 2,000 miles out over the Atlantic. From Grinelli, the picture would be landline to London and broadcast on BBC and ITV networks. The first picture received was a poor one, but faults at the Cornwall end were quickly righted, and then the face of Frederick R. Capel was clearly seen. He is chairman of the American Telephone Company. Captain Booth and his team were happy men. A few more Telstars in orbit, and we could have, all round the clock, World TV. Prophets are saying that this motor show at Earl's Court is the last one with Britain outside the common market. Already the automobile industry in this country accepts the challenge of selling in the continental countries. New models like the Cortina from the Ford stable will catch the eye of hundreds of buyers visiting the show from across the channel. The British Motor Corporation ranges over the entire field of motoring, meeting almost every need and every purse. The Hillman Super Minx is an eyeful standing up to the competition of the three lovelies trying it out for comfort. Lord Montague must have found the E-Type quite a contrast to those vintage cars he collects at Bewley. This car industry is one of Britain's big dollar earners. Perhaps in the next few years, it will expand and put us really on the map of Europe. Certainly this model has been an outstanding success since it erupted on the sports car world less than two years ago. Dolled up for Earl's Court, the famous 3.8 six-cylinder engine. 
much smaller, but very much in the high performance class, the Lotus Elan, built on the foundation of racing success and with refinements every owner will appreciate. The Lotus Elan has twin two-choke carburetors and, of course, disc brakes. The MG 1100, a winner in its class if ever there was one. As for the Continental Bentley, where is the motorist with 9,000 pounds to spare who could possibly resist it? It's bewildering, this multitude of fine cars, more than holding their own in the world's most competitive industry. Manufacturers are now concentrating their gaze on the lands across the channel, where in all probability, great new markets, the common market, await those who can deliver the right goods at the right price. If this year's motor show is any guide, the British car industry will rise to the opportunity. beautiful shape of things to come. A model of the Anglo-French Concorde airliner to be carrying 100 passengers by 1970. At Lancaster House, the aviation minister, Mr. Julian Amory, in company with the French ambassador, almost crooned in admiration over the brainchild of their two countries. On behalf of their governments, they signed the agreement for the joint development and production, a foretaste, perhaps, of common market cooperation. Concorde has a perfect pedigree. In the early days, the Ferry Delta II proved faster than sound flying to be possible. Then the French Trident, powered by two jets and a rocket motor, flew twice the speed of sound. At the Bedford Wind Tunnel, flight conditions at these fantastic speeds are simulated, a tremendous help to the designers of the airframe, in this case a model of the Concorde. Watching is the head of the Bristol design team of the British Aviation Corporation. On the test bed here, a Bristol Sydney Olympus engine, the type that will power the Concorde. The same engine has been tested in flight, powering a Vulcan bomber. The Hanley Page 115 demonstrated the possibility of handling the slender Delta Wing aircraft at low speed. More tests were made by the Bristol T-188 Flying Laboratory. With a pedigree like that, the Concorde should capture a big slice of the Atlantic traffic for Britain and France. Despite superpower tension and the threat of world conflict, Pathé News always tried to bring a lighter note to their programs. The stories about major sporting events, the world of entertainment and fashion. Pathé regularly brought laughter and relief to the millions who went to the cinema every week. Toys were on show at some of Brighton's leading hotels and the Corn Exchange. The British Toy Fair had the pick of the products sent in by 300 exhibitors. The industry can't afford to wait till a few weeks before Christmas. It has to make plans a long way ahead. And every year, British toys get more attractive and ingenious. Teaching the young idea to shoot with a toy automatic rifle. It stops father from having that lazy Sunday afternoon nap. Wonderful sailing ship for the do-it-yourself child, built from a kit of parts. The ship, not the child. A puppet show. Endless fun they'll never tire of. The old-fashioned kitty who was inseparable from an old rag doll is a thing of the past. Today's children are sophisticated. Their father's got to shell out and look happy. To get a man to stand up against Billy Walker here in the all-white strip, they had to go as far as Austria. Emil Svaricek shaped well at first, and it looked as though the West Ham Walloper wouldn't land his usual one-round KO, as the huge crowd at the Albert Hall were eager to see.
Austrian had Walker on the receiving end at one stage. Check had to take the count of eight, compulsory in amateur boxing. The bell doesn't stop the count. That's the new amateur rule. So once again, Billy was one round walker. Harlow Newtown gave a new twist to the twist. A marathon to see if some of the 29 competitors could beat the American record of 18 hours, 4 minutes. No bar to a drink, so long as the feet kept moving. Time didn't pass that quickly for the young folks twisting away on the floor. The hours began to drag, and there were signs of it at this stage. The rules laid down a 20-minute break every four hours, as well as a three-minute rest every hour. The record player was the only thing that never flagged as the competitors began to drop out. Mary Ann Moles was still twisting while strong young men became stretcher cases. After 20 hours, 17-year-old Mary received the women's prize of 10 pounds. She certainly won it the hard way. The winner lasted 32 hours, 31 minutes. He's Kevin O'Brien, world champion. Mecca of show business for the day, the Savoy Hotel. Cliff Richard had very good reason to be there. One clue, the presence of Billy Butlin, a variety club occasion, obviously. Deborah Carr was among the celebrities, and Rita Tushingham left with Vanessa Redgrave. They were attending the show business awards luncheon with youth at the top. Helen Shapiro for one. Dirk Bogard must have felt quite senior as Helen received the award as most promising newcomer. For Arthur Haynes, the ITV award. Albert Finney, stage actor of 1961. Cliff Richard declared show business personality of 1961. Three wonderful young ones with millions of fans. Youth has told opportunity, no need to knock. The long saga of Henry Cooper and Joe Erskine went a stage further at Nottingham Ice Stadium. Cooper on the right here, defending his British and Empire heavyweight title. Promoter Reg King was right in predicting that the fight would draw a capacity crowd, though this was the fifth time these gladiators have met in the professional ring. Cooper was facing a skillful boxer in the early rounds, but Erskine soon lost his speed, and then it was the old story. The Welshman was cut over the left eye. They worked hard on that eye in Erskine's corner at the end of round eight. Full of pluck, he came out again, but with hardly a chance. Erskine's eye was worse than ever, though he still wanted to go on. To save him further injury, referee Frank Wilson decided to stop the fight. Unknown to the crowd, Cooper had fought with a hand damaged in training. Joe Erskine required hospital treatment for that eye. Though Cooper once again had the Lonsdale belt, his prospects of ever getting a crack at the world title seemed dim. But anyway, Henry, keep going. Upon football's biggest occasion, the seal is set by the arrival of Her Majesty, a cherry red ensemble very much taking the eye. two great teams come out of the field in a calm, almost formal way, which is part of cup final tradition. 
Spurs confident of retaining the cup. Burnley all out to foil them. Referee R.J. Finney calls the captains together. Danny Blanchflower on the left and footballer of the year Jimmy Adamson. And Jimmy performs a captain's duty by winning the toss. Though at Wembley on a calm day, that's not much advantage. The game is on. The match with 22 players, all of the highest standard. What a dramatic start. The game is only three minutes old when, from the head of Bobby Smith, the ball is at the magic feet of Jimmy Greaves. He half loses control, regains it, and flashes it into the net. As the first half progresses, both goals have narrow escapes. The brilliant forwards of each team make dangerous attacks, but get the ball into the net, they cannot. Forty-five minutes of some of the best play Wembley's ever seen pass all too quickly, and still there's no further score when it's half time. And dramatically as the game opened, so the second half begins. Slow motion lays bare action which was almost too quick for the normal eye to follow. Burnley left winger Gordon Harris passes to Jimmy Robson. Between Brown's feet, it's in the net. Burnley have drawn level. Now it's anybody's match. But the cheers of Burnley fans hardly die down when drama piles on drama. That superb player, John White, crosses the ball to the feet of Bobby Smith. Spurs have the lead again. Burnley show their class and fighting spirit by refusing to be downhearted by that Spurs goal. Nine minutes of play remain now. Medwin's shot is handled by centre-half Cummings. Penalty against Burnley. Blanche Flower himself takes the kick. It seems that Spurs really have the game in the bag now. 3-1 in the lead and only a few minutes to go. It's all over, Spurs have won, 3-1. For the second year running, Danny Blanchflower has the honor to lead his cup-winning team up to the Royal Box. Her Majesty congratulates him, returning to the keeping of Tottenham Hotspur, the most coveted of all sporting trophies. John Surtees, former motorcycle champion, now an ace car racer. Jim Clark also seeking fame in this field. And Graham Hill, maybe world champion someday. Driving a Cooper, Bruce McLaren. In this island, a great success last season. The big race today, the 14th International Trophy. And away they go. The race is run over 52 laps of the Silverstone course, about 152 miles. Surtees, Lola overtaking Chamberlain. Bruce McLaren going well in his Cooper. Two unlucky cars already out to grass. Jim Clark led nearly all the way. Close in pursuit of Clark now, Graham Hill. Hill forced his BRM to the front to win the race at 99.7 miles an hour. Raymond May's long faith in the BRM justified up to the hill. A great day for Graham Hill left, hard luck for Jim Clark. Swinging along to the theatre, the band of the Coldstream Guards.
What a rousing introduction to the most important premiere in the West End for a long time. Frankie Vaughan with his wife, and a host of celebrities coming thick and fast. April R. Rich. It is a musical occasion, so top musicians, here's Tony Crombie with his wife, were there in plenty. Maestro and Mrs. Edmundo Ross. Guy Roth. Sidney Tapler. Sylvia Sims. Davy Kay. Eleanor Summerfield. Steve Rice. What a delightful surprise to see Sterling Moss on his feet again and once more in touch with show business. Launched that evening was a musical to remember. In the Royal Hall Harrogate, there's no doubt that something is happening in the world of men's fashions. Neither white jeans nor a suede shirt is the staid man's cup of tea, but then the staid man is apparently on the way out as far as clothes are concerned. The heritage shirt with rust slacks shows the trend today. And for the country, try something in this style. In the sun, what better than Bermuda shorts and jacket? Get the general idea? Don't be afraid of something new. Then the opposite sex will be really interested. The shorty pajamas, man's answer to the shorty nighty. They speak for themselves. Away with a black dinner suit. Introduce some gaiety into the evening. You can even go to the length of Madras trues with a blue jacket. The mink collar is detachable, and you know that's a very good thing. Before handing it to the hat check girl, you'll put it away out of sight. And to make absolutely sure that it's safe, use the double security thief proof lock. Southern Rhodesia has a job in its hands. Operation White Rhino, involving the transport of the animals more than a thousand miles from Kariba to a national park. As the rhino weighs a ton and has mixed feelings about the move, there was excitement and danger galore. No use telling this tough fellow he'd have drowned but for the rescue. To him, it was gross interference with the liberty of the animal subject. Meanwhile, above the Kariba Dam, the work of animal rescue seems unending. Troops are helping out. Their pay parade, the only military-looking part of the exercise. Nothing to buy up here, but never say no to money. So finance looked after onto the lake, where there are warthogs to be brought to safety. A smaller proposition than the rhino, they're man-killers all the same if they get the chance. You just can't get it into their heads that this is for their own good. Even the tortoise dislikes being pushed around. Warthogs can't stand human beings, and if it's one thing to rescue them, setting them free is still more hazardous. Watch out, soldiers, or you've had it. Not even the worst fog for a decade could stop Huddersfield from the upholders of law and order downwards, from welcoming home Anita Lonsborough. Mother stepped out first, then Anita herself, warmly greeted by the mayor on behalf of all the townspeople. Weather apart, what a glorious homecoming for the triple gold medalist of the Commonwealth Games. The mayor escorted her into the town hall for a civic reception. Sitting between the mayor and her mother, Anita was being honored by her own townsfolk, and of them, her father must surely have been the proudest as the three gold medals were produced for all to see. Perth was marvellous, but cheers in Huddersfield. That was really something. And how well Anita Lonsborough deserved it all. Now south to meet Linda Ludgrove, very pleased with her poodle Goldie, the family's present. Linda's only 15. A child not very long ago, now world famous. She brought two gold medals back from Perth, proving herself to be the fastest backstroke swimmer of them all. She'd taken good care to have with her the Indian doll, the lucky mascot which has never let her down. At Sydenham School, the headmistress said they were all proud of her. Excused school uniform for the day, Linda wore her bright games outfit. Only a few days before, she'd been in Perth. Now she was back in foggy London. But the warmth of her welcome made them all forget the cold outside. 
The meal staff baked her a lovely cake with pink icing to match the Empire Games outfit. And there was the Linda Ludgrove Championship Cup, which school swimmers will compete for every year. What a fairy book story it all was. The girls couldn't wait to see those wonderful medals. Now down to earth. Even Linda has that GCE to think of. So she's putting Perth behind her and concentrating on her studies. Girls, the next lesson is swimming. A royal visit to the headquarters of the English Folk Dance and Song Society. A place where the twist doesn't get a look in and there's a real breath of old England. Naturally, a warm-hearted reception for the princess. was a dangerous year, one that will stand out in the 20th century. A year in which the world edged to the brink of nuclear war and then mercifully pulled back. Despite all the carnage and suffering of years to come, 1962 will be remembered for the unnerving feeling of impending doom, but also for the fact that the world came through the ordeal and has since become a safer place. 1962, a year to remember.